Everybody, thank you for listening to the Search Engineers Marketing Podcast. Today, we have a really, really special guest on the show. We have Brandon Cook, and we have Parker Mickelson of Clean Origin. Parker Mickelson is the uh, essentially the Google Ads guy, the data analysis guy. I hope I'm not butchering his job title. Uh, and then Brandon Cook also is the director of marketing for Clean Origin. Uh, they, they were kind enough to share their time with me today to talk a little bit about their business, what they're doing to grow the business, and some really, really exciting, awesome news that is happening inside their company right now. These guys are killing it uh, and uh, they were really kind enough to lend their time. So if you guys get value, please consider leaving us a comment on your podcast preferred app uh, on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again, Brandon and Parker for joining us. All right, guys, and we are live. Welcome to the Search Engineers Marketing Podcast, the e-commerce agency podcast for e-commerce store owners. Uh, we Today, we have Brandon Cook and Parker Mickelson. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Um, guys, so Brandon Cook is the director of marketing for a pair of flourishing direct-to-consumer jewelry retailers, Great Heights, and Clean Origin. And for the past four years, he's worked tirelessly to establish a foothold in the right for uh, disruption jewelry category, focused specifically on lab-created diamonds. In past lives, he has spent time managing marketing efforts for leading telecom affiliates, reviving direct sales jewelry brands, and even removing millions of illicit search engine listings as the co-founder of an anti-piracy company. And Parker Mickelson is the acquisition marketing manager at Clean Origin, a direct-to-consumer jewelry retailer focused on lab-created diamonds. He comes from a fintech, uh, from fintech, and has a background in data analysis and organic search. Recently, made the change to paid search to become a more full-stack search marketer. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us, Matt. Um, Parker, I think you're muted. Just a heads up, just in case. Yep. Okay, sweet. Now, uh, now Brandon was invited into the podcast originally and actually had his wild card on the back end, Parker didn't even tell me. And he was like, yeah, Matt, listen, like I can talk to you about macros, but like, you know, boom, tricky. I got Parker right behind me. Thanks a lot, guys. That's right. Uh, yeah, Parker, um, he, Parker, you came on the team in July, right? Yep, in July. Uh, right, he's, he's done some consulting for our business uh, since January and he is in the weeds every day. And he's a, he's a real sport in terms of the, the data analysis component, one, he's a champion at it. And two, um, we're finding meaningful uh, incremental incrementality out of our search program every day from his efforts. So um, great to have, I'm glad that we could add Parker in at the last moment here. Yeah, yeah. That, I was super surprised by that. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for adding me on. It's exciting. For sure, man. Yeah, no, I'm excited to have you. So now, Parker, you're the you're the data analysis guy, the Google Ads guy. You were doing consulting for Clean Origin. Tell me a little bit about what type of consulting work you were doing for them. Was that through your own uh, company or were you with somebody else? Yeah, no, I was just helping out with uh, the Google Ads stuff. Um, just I wasn't with my own company or anything. Just Brandon was helping or Brandon needed some help. So I came on board, got linked up through a mutual acquaintance and was happy to jump into the Google ads account and Microsoft ads. Um, that's what I like to do. So. Yeah, man. So you're, you're mainly a search guy. Do you also do social? Do you do, or, you know, are, are you SEO and paid search or. Yeah. So previously I was a manager of SEO and paid search. So I was doing both. Um, currently I'm focused on all acquisition marketing for clean origin. So there is some Facebook, some OTT, uh, but primarily the bread and butter is going to be Google ads and Microsoft ads for us. Okay. Now, um, now Microsoft ads, that's something that always surprises me because it, it, it's shockingly like super effective. And I think that, I think it's, it's, it, I think the cost per click in my experience has been lower. I don't know about you guys, the cost per click has been lower. Um, the, the quality search traffic also has been surprisingly like in, you could say better, you know, um, data has shown, I've, I've seen, um, and I'll, I'll leave like a little link in the description for this Statista article saying that about, I think it's like 33% or more of Bing users make over 100K a year 
or something like that, some type, some sort of number like that. So the quality of the search that actually comes in, surprisingly for Bing, is great. What, what do you think about that? What have you seen? Um, I think it depends on the industry quite a bit. So in the fintech role, um, Bing underperformed for us, but I have noticed that with Clean Origin that it's performing pretty well or on par with uh, Google Ads. And I'm actually digging in more into that right now. Uh, that's what I was working on prior to hopping on this uh, podcast, actually. So digging into it, um, average CPC, like you said, is definitely lower in Microsoft ads. Okay. Um, I, I think a lot of people sleep on Bing ads. Um, and that's, I, I think internally we've had this conversation and we do some, you know, education to people that are non, non search experts. And the fact that people are sleeping on it, particularly in like an e-commerce vertical, it's raw, it's raw opportunity. Um, that's, and that's what exactly to your point, like it's lower CPCs in the, <clears throat> Well, I think that your um, stat on Statista for the average income of those uh, individuals using Bing or Microsoft, that it's not really surprising to me because mm -hmm. if you think about the cohort that's going to leave uh, Bing ads as their default browser <laughs> or default search engine on their browser. Right. Uh, yeah, they're probably a little bit further along in life and they might not be as tech savvy. And that might also correlate to having a higher income. and that's bread and butter for us because it's a lower cost to, to obtain them and they have more they they have more discretionary income to spend. So it's a it's a double whammy in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They they purchase a Windows, right? They put a Windows mm -hmm. laptop, they purchase an Android. And they're like, I don't know how to use this thing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, now, Parker, now you were talking about right before you hopped on this call, you were doing a little bit of data analysis for Clean Origin. Um, now, are you talking like that was inside the Google Ads account, inside the Bing Ads account, or are you like aggregating data from external sources? What does that process look like? Yeah, so I'm uh, taking monthly data going back historically with Google Ads, Facebook, and Microsoft Ads, and seeing, pulling out like, ROAs and ROI on all of the spend there with like our transactions and revenue to see uh, if bridal versus non-bridal is performing better, better in mm -hmm. terms of uh, ROI and ROAs. That's okay. really important for us, Matt, because, uh, you know, we being in the jewelry industry, especially in these higher, higher dollar um, arenas um, and product types, Mm. breaking out you heard bridal and non-bridal and for you know parker and i that's that's our everyday chit chat uh for somebody that's you know not as familiar with this category mm. you have to really slice and dice um the product types into very very small pieces um with a very long uh attribution window so we're we're looking at kind of in, in the sense like a macro level how do our product types perform against each other? Um, and how do we find, how do we find more efficiency? Um, in the past where there's shorter transaction windows, um, I've sold even uh, refrigerator filters online and they have a very short transaction window. So you can pop that into Kenshu and say, okay, where's, what's our margin on these product groups? Let's bucket them together and let's look at the ROI. It gets a little bit harder when you have really long attribution windows, uh, like in the jewelry ca category. And then there's price differentials, um, you know, from products that we can sell a diamond to you for $500 and we can sell a diamond to you for $50,000. Right. And the ROI on those, um, both within that spectrum of, of what a consumer is willing to spend on a diamond as well as the product type. That's what gets dicey. And then you have to layer on, um, I think about it almost in terms of like a, a pivot table. And it's like, we, you layer, you have those layers of complexity within the product types. And then you have multiple account types, i.e. Google, Bing, God forbid, uh, Yahoo search network. And, and then it gets even more dicey. So there's layers and layers to that. And that's where, you know, Parker spends uh, so much of his time and I'm so grateful. <laughs> Hey, listen, we make sales on Yahoo too, man. Don't yeah. leave out Yahoo, you know? It's a source of revenue. I'm sure it is for you too, Parker. Do you, do you see Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, AOL sales over there? Uh, yeah, occasionally. Yep. It happens. It happens. 
So now what does the, I'm interested because you said, you know, you can sell a $200 dime, you can sell a $50,000 dime, right? Are you using PPC for your $50,000 products? Yeah. Yeah. We have shopping uh, accounts set up for that and it's broken out. Like the product group is broken out in terms of carrot size. So anything over, I believe it's four plus carrots is its own product group. And, um, they're loose diamonds that we have advertised in the, in the serve. Okay. So now for those, you're, you're messing maybe a little bit with search text ads and product listing ads. Just product listing ads. Just product listing ads. So you're Shopping not ads. doing search yeah. ads for those. Um, I, well, we have, we have search ads, but they're going to like, uh, they're not going to like a PLA for that or PD. Right. So, yeah. Right. And, then, and a lot of that, Matt, is you don't really, in a lot of cases, you don't have control, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether someone's, if they're searching, the, I think the, the uh, nuance of our business specifically is we sell lab created diamonds and lab created diamonds um, have over 50% consumer awareness, but those people are, have done a little bit of research to find out that there's such a thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time that they figured out oh, I want a lab-created diamond, they might just be looking for lab-created diamonds as a whole. And in that circumstance, it's like, well, we, we got you. We'll, we'll serve you an ad. Parker's on it. Right. Um, we, we drop you on a diamond, on diamond page. But from there, you have some decisions to make on what's your budget, how much can you afford, and how big of a stone do you want. So right. in a lot of cases, we're not able to yank out as much detail, but in cases uh, like Parker mentioned in PLAs, like, mm -hmm. yeah, you get a little bit more informed there. So there's more variables with the type of product. And so the, the, intent, the, the intent that they have behind their, their search query of lab created diamond for sale, et cetera, et cetera, um, they, you still, it, there's still a, uh, a multiple number of variables of what they might need after that. So you might take them to a landing page that has a sort of customized table type of thing. What does that landing page look like? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to describe because I, I think when I first entered this vertical, I thought it was an, a suboptimal PLP, PLP product landing page because when the, it is a table, it's almost like a spreadsheet. And yeah. when you see that as a consumer, I think it can be daunting in a lot of cases, but when you when you pound your head on it day after day, especially you know being in the business for a long time, I really get it. But for even for consumers that you know they may take um, weeks in a, in a diamond purchase decision, they kind of want it break, broken down that way. They want to be able to compare similar attributes, um, i.e., the four C's: color, cut, carrot size. Um, and clarity. So they want to be able to toggle um, this kind of spreadsheet looking PLP. And in pretty much the standard uh, diamond PLP amongst uh, popular retailers, there's filters. And so you adjust those filters to reflect the four C's and kind of find the sweet spot based on what you're looking for. Some people want an absolutely pristine uh, clarity with no inclusions. And then other people, you know, they just want a bigger carrot size and they would trade off on some of the other characteristics. And then some people want the full enchilada. So it's kind of figuring out what they want. And from there, we can kind of um, help guide customers closer to what they want. Um, right. But in a lot of cases, they're, they're starting their queries to your point with, okay, just sh show me some diamond, show me a lab created diamond. And they might give us, um, one of those specs or two of those specs and then we can kind of mm -hmm. narrow down from there right but some of the onus is on that customer to make those decisions and that's where we can get more informed about how we push them through uh, the customer funnel interesting so so parker do you guys have specific landing pages for the more uh the more narrow niche search query so like if they say they want to lab created diamond, they know the carrot, they know the size, they know, you know, everything down to the detail where maybe they don't need to see the table. Are you marketing a specific landing page with that ready for them? Or are you still, what does that look like? No, we're still sending them the same kind of like spreadsheet style landing page, right. and letting them make the decision. Okay. Awesome. Now, 
how 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 customer service intensive is that when they get to that landing page? Are, are they like what 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 percentage of the time do you find they live chat, phone call, stuff like that? That kind of depends on how far along the customer is to in their purchase path. So for some for someone that's just discovered that I've created diamonds yesterday, they might take a look at that grid and say, okay, show me some one carat diamonds here. And then they that's fresh in their mind because they might have visited a store yesterday. And in, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of in-store purchases still happening. Mm -hmm. majority of, so a, a majority of purchases in this category are still made in retail stores, brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. But they might have that price in a business card from um, a popular retailer in their hand and say, okay, they said that they could give me a one carat diamond for with certain criteria for $5,000. Right. They, they hit our page um, and they start making that research. Then they see, oh, well, this is actually much more, uh, this is much less expensive than what I just saw in the store. Um, in that case, you know, it might take a couple of more sessions for them to really narrow down their understanding. Mm -hmm. But in the as they narrow down <clears throat> that decision making purchase, uh, that decision making for that purchase, they will uh, often engage with uh, customer service. And we're seeing a fairly high percentage of people that are hitting lower funnel. And that's why we really we really pride ourselves as a retailer and as a brand on our customer service. When you yeah. get to that point as a customer, uh, we're just, we're there with open arms. We're not super aggressive on, you know, throwing in anything e-commerce wise as pop-ups, things of that nature. Right. We're there. Um, we have, we just introduced in the last year during COVID a virtual appointment. And what we're seeing is people are starting to gravitate towards that. And once we get them into that decision-making process and say, okay, well, just tell, tell us more about what you want. We pride ourselves extremely on how talented our customer service team is. They're not commissioned. Um, they're just, they just all have five, 10 years of jewelry experience. And so when you get on the phone with them, they're going to show you value and they're going to show you you know, this is what is probably going to work for you. And they can even do a lot of like customizations and things of that nature, because this is a very emotional purchase. So mm -hmm. when you start thinking about those layers to it, you know, having a 45 minute session with one of those customer service agents is so valuable. And we do, we do see that work pretty well um, because when they get to that stage, it's, it's, it's a lot about just being supportive. Um, yeah. and some retailers are missing the mark on that. And we're doubling down. That's great, man. Yeah, I, I've definitely seen it in my experience with my own stores. Just focusing on giving as much like value, right? So like value first, mm -hmm. like, like you know, you get them into your funnel rather than it being like calling them twice a day, emailing them twice a day, putting them on a follow-up season. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like having virtual assistants reach out to them. They, you know what I mean? Like it, it's like if, if I can just say, okay, um, you know, of course, you know, there's, there's, there's over aggressiveness and then under aggressiveness, you could yep. not be helpful and not actually try to see that you're helping them. Right. But like, I've really seen that. And that's cool for me because, uh, I haven't been, I'm not a salesy guy. I've worked at a sales job for three months. I was fired for having low <laughs> performance. Right. And funny enough, I'm actually in sales and marketing as my main career now. Um, that actually works because I just try to just be helpful. And so that's really, you know, encouraging to hear, you know, a company like yours, you guys actually just try to focus on actually just being helpful rather than aggressively nailing it down. Yeah. Well, and it, it's particularly important in our category because there, there's a lot of nerves. It's a very emotional purchase. And for a lot of people, this is not just one of the biggest retail purchases they'll ever make outside of a house or a car, you know, this is up there. Um, but it's yeah. also, they're, they're going to change, this could change the course of their life. And so we're very sensitive to it. We're very patient. We're, we're never pushy. Um, and to, to that end, it's like tr providing that true value. Um, you know, that's a really a source of inspiration for our brand as a whole, where it's like that transparency and empathy to the customer that's what that's what drives us because when you get get the right um, person on the line with that customer, they they genuinely feel that value. And I think that what what you're saying, Matt, about leaning into that, 
that's a big part of brand. Like, like that's yeah. how you establish relationships, establish trust, even to the extent of, and I don't know how much our customer service team does this, but thinking about, you know, if someone has a better diamond price, we can't really, it's, I, I don't think that our customer service team would really um, obfuscate or, or glass, gloss over that because customers are doing those types of comparisons. And it's like, okay, well, you know, if you're finding a better, I've seen instances of this and I just don't know how much we're doing it internally, but I've seen it to where it's like, if you find a better diamond price, we're not gonna, we're gonna say, go, go get the best value you can. It's like that, that's such a, an obvious thing in, in something like the diamonds where it's a little bit commoditized and it's like, mm -hmm. if you're getting a better deal somewhere else, go get it. Like we're, su we're supportive of you because these people are making, like I said, such important decisions in their lives. So it would be really selfish of us to just be like, no, buy our diamonds. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, I make a big purchase and now I'm looking for revenge. Right. So it's like, you know, you, you don't want that entangled right. in your marriage. You know? <laughs> right. Well, and, and I think that that transparency also, um, it resonates. Those, those folks, um, we're, our company's going to be around for a while. So having that level of transparency, even if they went and bought a diamond somewhere else, they might come back and say, actually, you guys have the exact band that I wanted anyway. Um, I felt so good working with you guys. I'm going with Queen Origin this time. Um, so that's that's where you can really win those customer battles just by having empathy. Sweet, man. Yeah, Parker, I want to sub you back in. You talked about, I think it was something to the degree of split testing between bridal and what was the other one? Non-bridal. Okay, right. Non-bridal, right, right. Bridal, bridal and non-bridal. Now tell me a little bit about the difference between the two and what that testing looks like. Yeah, so I'm still pulling all the, the numbers and looking at that, um, trying to figure out exactly what we're doing with it. But um, bridal is like engagement rings, loose diamonds, that sort of stuff. Non-bridal is stud earrings, bracelets, pendants, that those kind of things. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to see which which one has higher ROIs and, and ROAs and all of that stuff within our Google Ads account. Right, so... When you when you kind of split test between the two, now you now is it that you're testing sort of the same things for the two just to kind of like what what does that analysis look like? Like what do you do with that information once you find okay, bridal does the better? Like how does that help guide you more? Is that sort of like just how to optimize ad spend between the two? Yeah, yeah. So it's optimizing ad spend between the two and seeing where we want to allocate like spend more. Interesting. Okay. Now out of curiosity, um, which which do you see typically performs better? Yeah, um, early indications are showing it looks like non-bridal has a little bit higher ROI. Okay, is that, do you think because it's less niche? Like what, what do you think that could be? Uh, I don't know. Brandon, do you have any thoughts there? Margins. Um, margins. Uh, so... We have what what's even more fascinating, and we kind of we might have to gloss over a little bit of this, but we have sure. you know, we'll look at our we have, look at ROAS, and ROAS really is really easy to look at, right? Because you within a Google Ads account, you can understand money in, money out. Um, but what you don't understand is profitability, and there are mechanisms specifically in Google Ads where you can start pipe, pipe, piping in your profit margins. Um, we're doing some a lot of that work outside of the account because it's the account is not always um, as accurate as we would like it to be in capturing a long purchase path. Um, if somebody's shopping for six months, um, yeah. they might hit that account a couple of times, but then they just know clean origin and they mm -hmm. come back a, another dozen times on three different devices and it might not be attributed the way it should be. So when we yank that stuff down, we want to understand, okay, let's look at what we're spending here. Let's look at the profitability and separate it out ROAS and ROI. Because ROAS, in a lot of cases, ROAS, uh, 
specifically in the bridal category, it's going to look really good. Bridal, you know, you're going to spend a lot more on a an engagement ring than you would for an anniversary gift. So mm -hmm. you can see that that's a higher rise, but the profitability or margins on those are a little bit different. And so you have that's this is one of the most um, direct and um, and really succinct ways that we I've ever looked at ROI versus ROAS and understood, wow, there's a there's quite a bit of separation here. And Parker, to his credit, is doing the brunt of that work. Um, but it's it's really fascinating to see a separation from ROI and ROAS in this circumstance. Interesting, interesting, very cool. Now, now, Parker, you you said you started July fifth. With the company officially, you were consulting for them a little while ago, um, and you kind of talked about now you're sort of catching up on the data in the ads accounts, right? Um, at least for myself, uh, like, like, what, what do you think? Like, have you have you started your own stores in the past? Like, how did your experience with search advertising start? Yeah, so um, I have not started my own stores. Uh, I got into marketing in college, actually, that's what I got my degree in, and then started doing some marketing for a local roofing company for a, a couple years, and then I got uh, brought on board a, a company called credit.com, um, and I was doing their marketing, well, search marketing for them, so SEO. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off as a data analyst, and then uh, started taking on some paid search towards like the last like year and a half while I was there. Sweet man. And, and how, and how long have you been doing search advertising for? Um, I want to say since like 2016. 2016. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So about five years or so, maybe more or less. Yeah. Now, when you started, like, so like when you started getting into the clean origin account, like what does that process look like? for like you get into their you get in their account you you look at all the data from the past and you just kind of figure out how to like where to go from there like you kind of get in the driver's seat and you just figure out where's this thing going yep exactly yeah i look at all the settings for each campaign um all the audiences targeting i just go through the weeds and look i have a google doc that i put together usually and i just kind of like go through that and check off all these boxes and see what see what's missing if there's any extensions that are missing and then i present like that to brandon when i was doing the consulting and then he'd give me the go ahead to go make changes with the extensions or add add things here or there and so that's usually my process with that very cool man see you see parker has a very very results intensive position right like now for you right like because I like data analysis being in the driver's seat that is like the spotlight is on you right <laughs> like True. you know not necessarily in like a totally negative way either yeah. but like I, like now how do you gauge that like like do you feel like wh what are the characteristics of somebody that needs to kind of have that position like do you like do you have some sort of like you know meditation you know what i'm saying like <laughs> um no uh i i just like spreadsheets man i like to get in and make spreadsheets and it's kind of weird but it's nice when you get all the uh the functions that are firing and working together and working how you want so that's what i like to do i don't know um I would cool. second that for Parker. I mean, I've, like I said, I've given him some props here, but it, you know, it, it, it kind of takes relentless um, digging and analysis pivot. You know, you have to be really strong at pivot tables um, and understanding. Um, I think when, when I was thinking about the when bringing Parker on and, and really like digging into what do landing pages look like and what do landing pages look like by, by campaign and then pivoting those out and saying, all right, well, what's the bounce rate for these or for each of these respective campaigns uh, on a specific landing page? Are we getting them to the right, each customer to the right place with their right set, with the right campaign, the right 
ad group and if underneath that again if you then drill down to the ad group level how do we then look at each ad group and say is there an outlier here is there someone that's not happy with this page and so yeah. it's that relentless pursuit um yeah and so true. I, I get to i mean I, I really am happy with what we're the way that we're working right now because i get to offer a, parker has about five years of experience in search i have a little over 10 and I get to offer a lot of perspectives and say, all right, let's dig in this direction. Let's dig in this direction and keep plowing through. And it's kind of, it's a, an adventure every single time. And if you don't look at it that, that if you don't look at it that way, you're not going to get the results. It's not going to be any fun. But if you pursue every question as an adventure and a possible uplift in outcomes, um, particularly revenue, it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, and I'm, I'm just happy that I can kind of jockey this a little bit. Um, it's, it's really fun. Yeah, you might not be the right person for the job if you are bored with looking at the, you know, the vulnerabilities and the and, and, and the areas of opportunity and things like that, right? Like if you're just looking at it like, oh, I got to come through and change these keywords again. I got to optimize the negative keyword lists and all that. Like you kind of need to, but really, it really it is though. And like, I never really like saw myself as somebody that would enjoy it. Right. But like, I really do appreciate looking at the account and saying like, where is this thing going? Like, what can we do? What can we change? And when you're focusing on like, you know, when you have your, the, the back end of the system's working great, you got the customer service, you have a great product, you have a great brand everything is in place, right? Um, and then you're inside that account and you have the opportunity to say, okay, what can we do to make things better? That's a really unique position to be in and a, a position to really give some awesome value. So I look at Parker, you know, I, I asked him about his routine, right? I'm just a little bit underwhelmed to be completely honest because I have my picture of Parker being, he wakes up 4 a.m. every day, runs for 10 miles. <laughs> <laughs> You know, come on, man. You're the engine. I needed, I needed a little more green smoothies. Veganism. No. <laughs> he, leaves uh, that, he leaves that to me. I'm in Colorado right now. So yeah. I, I, I fit the cliche, I would say. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. That's outdoors, outdoorsmanship. See, Parker, you're about to be in Denver, so you'll be a vegan. You'll be, you yeah. know, in no time, you know? <laughs> yep. Uh, I'll get, I used to snowboard a lot, so I'll get back into that mountain biking, all that sort of stuff. So, but sweet man, I, very cool. Yeah. Yep, got a, I got a puppy, so I wake up at 6 a.m. That helps. <laughs> there you go, man. That's cool. Well, congrats on the new puppy, congrats on the new job, Parker. Um, do you guys have any like what, like, I guess just before we close, like what, what is clean origin up to right now? Like what is like a new exciting thing in 2021 that has recently rolled around that, that like you guys have been focused on? Well, we just broke ground on Omnichannel. Um, so we have our first storefront in Dallas uh, that we opened in April. Wow. Um, it's, it has been uh, very successful. It's been quite a ride and, and just opening that door to omni-channel, like true omni-channel, where okay. we're seeing a lot of people do the research online, come in store, ask questions, or do the research in store, go home and make a purchase, or say, I'll feel better just picking it up in store. Um, having that component is so incredibly exciting. Um, I don't think we're, st we're going to stop with one store, um, to be honest, um, but I couldn't really give you a lot of detail on the cadencing of future stores, but it's just such an exciting opportunity to see those, those, the online component and the brick and mortar retail component working together in tandem to drive lift and, and, um, and drive incrementality from this, you know, natively digital brand. So that's something that I've never done um, explicitly in, in moving from the online component to brick and mortar. And I think the opportunities are, are just so immense that we're not going to stop here. Um, so that's been, I think, the most exciting thing of this year. That is really cool. Congrats on that. When did that Dallas store open? Uh, uh, mid-April um, and then it was fully ramped uh, you know really right away but it started ramping in May and then we're seeing every month just improved performance 
both in the online as well as uh, in the retail component. So that that familiarity and, and some of the work that Parker's doing to push into that metro, you know, it's 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 really incredible to see that incrementality. And I, that's like a whole other podcast of right. information to pull right. things apart. I was gonna ask, maybe are you guys running like local product listing ads in Dallas then? Or um, we don't have any local product listings, I don't believe. Okay. Um, but we do have some search campaigns. Cool, cool. That's so you on, guys are that's on the yeah. horizon though. That the local products uh, listing ad, that's that's a great question, Matt. And so you you definitely have your hands on it and being able to show that store inventory to people locally just it's absolutely killer and those are the things that we're just chipping away every single day and finding like that's just an immense opportunity um yeah, so yeah killer well you gotta let me know when you start those <laughs> parker i need an email from you hey here we go i need a screenshot of the serps i can do that <laughs> that'll be really cool that that's that's so exciting man you guys got so much going on right now um now, this is the first brick and mortar store you guys launched. When when did the business, when did the store, Clean Origin as a whole, when did that start? So that's a, a native e-commerce store. When did that originally launch? We got things rolling in late 2017. Um, by like January 2018, we're kind of starting to shape and mold the store a little bit more and understand it, but we had some sales in the pipes. Um, and, you know, what was, was surprising to me was at that time, I remember um, when we first started this project, I said, what the heck is a lab created diamond? Then by uh, early 2018, we started seeing some momentum. And by, I think, mid 2018, it was you know, full send and we haven't looked back. And now, um, you know, I think we're the biggest uh, purely lab created diamond retailer in the world. Um, so that on the direct com direct consumer component, you know, we're, we're swinging pretty hard. And um, yeah, I'm just, I think we're all super proud of the progress that we've made since then. It's, it's been such a ride so far, but like I said, we just broke ground on the store this year and it's, uh, it seems like it's snowballing really fast. <clears throat> That's amazing, man. I feel the energy, man. I feel the excitement. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, Parker, Brandon, do you guys have any specific links that you guys would like me to add in this description here? Any particular call to action you would like the listeners of this episode to check out? Uh, just visit cleanorigin.com, direct link. Um, yeah, that's it. I think that's that's great. Sweet. Parker, cleanorigin.com. Yep. Cleanorigin.com. <laughs> Parkermickelson.com. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sweet, guys. Guys, seriously, thank you both very much for joining me. And I hope to do this again once you guys launch that, you know, uh, that, uh, the, the, that Portland location. Okay, once we got that San Diego location. Yeah, if we can, anytime you want to jump on and circle back and have a follow-up podcast, yes. I know that's kind of fun. So anything. Yes. Cool. I would love that, man. Episode two, definitely coming soon. <laughs> Clean Origin is making moves. Parker is the man, okay? <laughs> 10 miles a day. Parker actually told me off air his morning routine Okay, he only <laughs> consumes green juices. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> this is soylent, soylent, soylent. soylent. <laughs> <laughs> guys, again, thank you very much. We're going to wrap up there. Cleanorigin.com, Brandon Cook, Parker Mickelson. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Matt. Thank Have a good day. You See too, you. guys. Cheers. Thanks again so much to Brandon and Parker for joining. Guys, if you guys are getting value from this show, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, to our uh, following us on podcast apps and leaving a comment and a review. It really, really helps us grow and uh, continue to share this content with more and more people. Uh, these guys are awesome and really, really took the time to give some major, major value to us. So uh, thanks again to them and uh, we'll see you in the next one.